the gog was there and more for miles around. So I asked him home to dinner just to see what I could see. This famous local prophet from here in Galilee. And I have no idea just how she got into the room. But you couldn't miss her gaudy clothes and her strong and sweet perfume. She went straight to Jesus' feet and stopped and stood right there and cried and wet his feet with tears and dried them with her hair. Out of all the women in my town, none was more well known for the flagrant sin she'd lived in and the wickedness she'd sown. But he didn't move to stop her. It seemed this prophet couldn't tell that the woman who was touching him was the kind they buy and sell. And I had no idea just what this Jesus planned to do when he said, Simon, there's something I need to say to you. So I said, teacher, if it's on your mind, then tell me what you will. As he began to speak to me, the room grew quickly still. Take a good look at this woman now, in spite of all her fears. She's kissed me and anointed me and washed my feet with tears. She's honored me, but you've been only rude to me instead. You gave no kiss of greeting, no anointing for my head. And her sins were red as scarlet, but now they're washed away. The love and face she's shown is all the price she had to pay. For the depth of God's forgiveness is more than you can see. In spite of what you think of her, she's beautiful to me. Well, my anger flamed to hatred. I wanted nothing more than to grab that prophet by the throat and throw him out the door to act like God forgiving sins and then speak so to me. This itinerant from Nazareth in backwoods Galilee but instead I sat and trembled shaken to the core the woman still was weeping as she knelt there on the floor Jesus turned to her and said your chains have been released your faith has saved you from your sins rise walk in peace and her sins were red as scarlet, but now they're washed away. The love and face she shown is all the price she had to pay. For the depth of God's forgiveness is deeper than the sea. No matter what the world may think, she's beautiful to me. And your sins were red as scarlet, but now they're washed away. The love and faith you've shown is all the price you've had to pay. For the depth of God's forgiveness is deeper than the sea. No matter what the world may think, you're beautiful to me. Thank you, Roger. There's a mistake we make. A lot of times we think life is about keeping score, about who's done right and who's done wrong, about who's good and who's bad, and Roger brought it home clear right between our eyes there. It's about relationship. It's about relationship. And kids, you are, uh, come on up here. If you're going to go trick-or-treating um, in the next month, 
and come on up and sit in the front row. We've got a video to show you while you're coming up. My goodness, Tina. You're killing me. I'll wait right here. Remember, you have to say trick or treat. One of those is for Tina. There you go. Oh, a trick or treat. Hurry up, buddy. But I didn't get to say trick or treat. Back again, huh? Yeah, I... Okay, we're having technical difficulties. Basically, let me illustrate. Boy walks up, says, can I have some candy? He's going to say trick or treat. But before he says trick or treat, wha-bam, 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 wha-bam. Here you go. The boy didn't get to say trick or treat. Mom looks at him, so he knocks again. Guy shows up. This time he's got Legos. And wha bam! Wha bam! Wha bam! Wha bam! Wha bam! Shuts the door. The kid didn't get to say trick or treat. So you know what he does? He looks at his mom and she's like, hurry up! Knock, 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 knock. He didn't get to say trick or treat. I'm really enjoying this. <laughs> Good luck keeping them under control this afternoon, buddy. <laughs> Did you know that Mr. Cuevas has invited all of you over to his house after you eat all this? I, that was a joke. That was a joke. Okay, so he knocks one last time. Boom, 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 boom. And... And he finally says, trick or treat. And the guy who's getting another gift for him says, oh, is it Halloween? <laughs> and the kid asks, do you do this all the time? See, here's the reality, guys. It's not about I knock and God gives me something. You know what it's about? It's about a relationship. You guys are free to go back whenever you want. Two. You get two pieces of candy, Mom just said. Oh. The rest you can take how many you want, okay? Good luck figuring this out. I'm going to talk to the rest of you while these guys try to figure out how to get their candy home because they didn't bring a bag. <laughs> Okay, here's the thing. We all think this relationship with God and with others is about I do something, God gives me something. I do something, God gives me something. That's what a relationship with God is, right? And, and the Pharisees actually even had the gall, the leaders, the elders, the teachers of the law, they had the gall just a few verses earlier to say, hey God, what's up with this? Jesus, are you in control or are we? And Jesus basically goes on to tell them a parable. Because he wants to change their perspective. Awesome. <laughs> Woo! Give these guys a hand. <laughs> Tina, did you get some chocolate up there? Okay. Do you want me to throw more at you? Just All right. Just get some from, your brother, from any of the kids down here. They've got plenty to share. All right. Now, here's the thing. We read in Luke chapter 20 about this relationship. Verse 9. He went on to tell the people a parable. Now, a parable is a story that has a meaning. Okay? And we tell stories that have meanings all the time in church, right? So, so here's where we're going. A man planted a vineyard, and he rented it to some farmers, and he went away for a long time. Now, 
by the time Luke wrote, this story had made it out into the Christian sphere. And so he gives us a little bit shorter version than Mark and Matthew did. Matthew and Mark describe the vineyard that he built, okay? And that's, here's what happened. The guy goes out and he builds a huge gigantic wall to protect his vineyard. Then he builds a tower and a wine press. And then he plants the vineyard. Okay? So basically, if you want to make a profit in the wine business, he's already prepared for that. Someone dropped chocolate. Your preacher loves you. So it's not just a house, not a, a vineyard. He didn't say, here, some land, good luck. Because this is usually what happens when we rent land, right? Anybody farm in their past or in the present? No. Anybody familiar with farm? Oh, right there. All right, guy, let me ask you a question. If you rent land, usually you're lucky if they've got what on that land? Anything. Usually, you're happy if there is anything there. And this vineyard owner made sure there was what there? Everything. Okay? This is you asking for a shack on your vacation and getting there and finding it is 4,000 square feet state-of-the-art jacuzzi pool downstairs. I don't know how to continue to describe it better because I've never been in a hotel that good. But, or how's that good? But you get where I'm going, right? This gigantic king-size bed, a chair that massages you while you watch on the 84-inch screen TV. This is the kind of environment that the owner has created. And he should make a profit on his own property, but instead, what did he do? He rented it out. And he left for a long, long time. Now you need to realize something. The owner is not about making money. He is all about what? Giving to these people and having this great relationship with them. He wants to go into business with them. He doesn't want to profit at their expense. He wants to bless them. He wants to love them. He wants to give to them. And, and a lot of us were in relationships. We have husbands and wives, children or parents. We have people we might work with. We have people we go to church with. We have these relationships. And a lot of times, we're living by this worldly standard, which is, if you give to me, then I will give back to you. But Jesus is talking about a totally different standard where God says, no, we're in relationship and I'm just going to give to you and I'm not worried about how much you give back, really. You're going to say, but Nathan, I know how this passage reads. It reads, at harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. Yeah. He sends somebody to these tenants saying, are we in a relationship? Because here I've given you this massive opportunity for profit. Are you willing to give me the typical rent for the typical piece of property? Not the Rolls Royce rent. Basically, this is the bank saying, hey, we're in a relationship. Um, would you like to pay the minimum amount we can charge you on your mortgage? I mean, we're going to cover the interest and the extra. We're just, all we want is just a tiny bit. And this is what the owner asked for. He doesn't ask for a huge amount. He asked for 
some, some. And instead of giving him some, the tenants did what? Sent him away empty-handed, right? Read it. Did he send him away empty-handed? Kind of. First, they did what? Okay, the mortgage company sends you a bill, the mailman hands it to you. So you beat up the mailman? Does that make sense to you? You beat up the person from the bank who calls you and says, hey, we need your payment. But that's what they do. So here's this God who wants to be in relationship, and these guys are what? Taking advantage of the relationship? Disregarding the relationship? Spitting on the relationship? And already in the mind of of those who are listening to this parable for the first time, this story for the first time, they're like, how could anybody abuse a relationship like that? Well, let's be honest, guys. We've all screwed up some relationships. We've all had good relationships. We've all had some bad relationships. But we've all made mistakes where we've been given a wonderful relationship with a company or with a person. And what have we sometimes done with those relationships? No? Yes? Yeah. Sometimes we chewed them up. Sometimes we took advantage. Sometimes they took advantage. But whatever happened, the relationship got messed up. Somebody felt beaten. And so it's, it's over. It's over. And the first group of people who ever heard this said, oh, it's over. Because when you don't pay the mortgage company what you owe it, what does the company do? It kicks you out. You don't want to pay rent? Fine. You are but God doesn't do this. He sent another servant. But that one, they also beat. And they treated him shamefully. And they sent him away empty-handed. Anybody notice something different here? What? Treated shamefully. Okay. I'm going to teach you a Greek word. Any nurses out here? No nurses? Your nurse? Okay. Greek word. You ready for it? All right. Tell me what you think it might mean in English. Ready? Here's the Greek word. Traumatize. Hurt badly. Anybody else know Greek today now? If I say the Greek word traumatize, you immediately know what that means, right? It means this wound is bad, it's deep, and a lot of times, it is permanent. I mean, you're watching a football game, and all of a sudden, the guy's leg snaps in two, and you see it wibble wobbling there. That's traumatizing to him. To you, that's like, oh, wow. I... Can you imagine someone deciding to break someone's leg like that intentionally? That's what they did to this guy all because the owner still wants to be in a relationship with him. So he sent another messenger saying, hey, let's straighten this out. Let's work this out. Let's figure out how we can have a relationship. Which is probably a recipe here for how to have a relationship from God. We often say, if you mistreat me, then I will withdraw my favor. I will pull back from the relationship. I'm going to back away a little bit. But what does God, I mean, sorry, the owner do when he gets mistreated? He puts more in. Because if I am putting something in and they're putting something in and I feel mistreated and I back up, what are they going to most likely do? They're going to back up too. Or if I push them out completely of the relationship, say, my vineyard, get out of here, relationship's over. God doesn't want that. He doesn't want that for any part of our life. And so the story continues. He sent still a third, and him they wounded and threw him out. 
and the owner of the vineyard. By the way, how many times has God tried to fix the relationship now? Three. Three. He's keeping trying. He's keeping trying. Wow. This point, give up, right? Give up, right? Give up, right? Then the owner of the vineyard said, what will I do? What will I do? And he says this, I'm going to send my son whom I love. Perhaps they'll respect him. Now let me just help you here, okay? Because in our society, if I send my kid over to your house, that's not an honor. That's, you know. But back in their culture, for me to send my adult son into your home, it was what? Yeah, it's like sending a part of me. It's a sign of respect. It is a, a incredible honor for somebody who, quite frankly, has... In this passage, have they deserved it? Do they deserve to be honored? Do they deserve to be trusted? Okay, guys. You might have a child today. You might have a parent today. You might have a spouse today. You might have a company today. You might have a friend today who has traumatized you, who has wounded you, who has treated you shamefully, who has not paid you back the way you feel you, you deserve to be treated. Maybe the person you feel traumatized by is even God. What if you're mad at God today? What if you're sitting here today saying, I don't believe in God, I'm not sure. God wants you to know. He's not going to pull out. He's going to keep sending and sending and sending until he sends his son, whom he loves. And this is the ultimate test of the relationship. How we treat a God's son is basically where we end up in this relationship. And this continues. On we go. When the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him. The inheritance will be ours then. So they threw him out of the vineyard. And guess what they did? And killed him. Now, I want you to realize something the Jewish audience would have picked up that we don't pick up. They threw him out of the vineyard and then they killed him. In our society, this doesn't make sense, right? I mean, why not just kill him and then throw him out of the vineyard? The answer is, in their society, if you shed blood on the land and it was impure blood that had been shed, like in a criminal act, like murder then that blood tainted the land. And so to honor God, they did what? Do you like this? Do you guys like this? I love God so much that I'm not going to kill somebody on my property. I'm going to kill them on somebody else's property. Does this make any sense? But this is often what we do in relationships. We have this code we operate by. This standard where we're like, I'm honoring God or I'm honoring myself or I'm honoring whatever system of justice I believe in when God has done what? He's put his heart out there. Or our spouse has put their heart out there. Or our company continues to pay us even when we're not doing our job as well as we should. Our children or our parents continue to invest in us even though we're not always as appreciative as we should be. It's funny because we have this mentality sometimes where we play this game that this, this, these guys do, where we have these little acts that we do that we think make up for all the bad acts that we do. Anybody hear about the shootings in Nairobi, Kenya Mall? You know what I'm talking about, right? 47 um, people, at least I, I, when I read it, it was at 47. I know it might have gone up since then. There's this story that came out, and it can't got me thinking about it. And here's what happened. There's this British kid who was with his British sister, and they were with somebody else, either their mom or some babysitter. Anyway, they were identified as British, not American, so they weren't shot. And as they're walking out, one of the kids 
just couldn't take it. And he walked up to one of the terrorists and he said, you're a very bad man. And, and the guy said, here's some candy. You have to forgive me. We're not monsters. You know, it, it, here's the way it works. You can kill as many people as you want as long as you give candy to a kid. Okay? So the next time you want to shoot somebody, just give candy to a child, say, I'm not a monster, and it's all okay. That, that's what happened. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. But sometimes I'll yell at my spouse. Or sometimes I yell at my kids. Or sometimes I'll, I'll only give 30 or 40% to a relationship or to the place I work or to my church. Or sometimes I will hold on to bitterness and resentment and I'll remember what they did for years and years and years on end. But as long as I forgive this one small thing they did, then I'm still basically a good person, right? And this is what's happening. God is saying, I forgive what? Everything so far. I'm forgiven everything. And these guys are saying what? So let's talk about relationships today. What does God want me to forgive? Everything I possibly can. To a point. What does God want me to do in this relationship? Just keep extending, keep extending, keep extending. What does God want me to stop doing? Resenting? He wants me to stop looking out for myself. He wants me to stop trying to profit at the other person's expense. He wants me to stop in this relationship asking the question, what's in it for me? Because over and over, this happens in our society. We say, if you talk nice to me, then I'll keep in this relationship. Or if you give me these pleasures, then I'll continue to be in this relationship. It's like trick or treat. What's the kid really saying? Either give me candy or I'm going to throw eggs at your house. Oh, okay, here's some candy, kid. Please don't throw eggs at my house. You're like, Nathan, they don't do that anymore. No, they don't. But here's the dilemma. We are often looking at our relationship with God as if we're in a contract. We're looking at our relationship with our spouse as if we're in a contract. We're looking at our relationship with our kids as if we're in a contract. Or with our parents as if we're in a contract. And God looks at us and he says, knock it off. You're in a covenant. You're in a committed relationship. You have pledged yourself to the other person. So suck it up and give it everything you've got. Make it succeed because you have my spirit in you. You have the ability. You have the love in your heart. Soften it up for these people for your child, for your grandchild, for your sister, for your brother, for your co-workers, for your fellow church members, just soften up. But instead, what these guys do? They said, this is the heir. Let's kill him. Then the inheritance will be ours. They throw him out of the vineyard. They kill him. And then we receive God's response. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He's going to come, and he's going to kill those tenants. And he's going to give that vineyard to others. If we don't enjoy this relationship with God, somebody else will. If we've been given friends, and we don't appreciate this relationship, God's like, fine, I'll give it to somebody else. I'm sorry. It's brutal. But our spouse, if we don't treat them well, God looks at us and says, fine, I've got somebody who will. Here's the reality of life. We have been blessed. God has poured out candy in our lives and our wives, and our, at least my wife has poured out tons of good things in my life. My kids have given me lots of good things. My parents have given me lots of good things. My mother-in-law 
and father-in-law and stepfather-in-law, and they've all given me wonderful things. I'm blessed. And God looks at me and says, are you thankful? Are you thankful? Yes, God, I am. Well, then start appreciating the relationship. Start working on the relationship. Start focusing on the relationship. When the people heard this, do you know what they said? May this never be. Hey, Jesus, even if we abuse our relationship with God, even if we destroy our relationship with you, please don't allow us to ever be punished for what we did wrong. Doesn't this sound like our society? We want all the benefits of a relationship, all the demands, all these things, but we want none of the... I'm sorry. Every single session of marital counseling comes down to this question. Do you want the demands or are you going to accept the responsibilities? And a lot of times, when both people are making demands, what's going to happen? Things will get worse to the point of divorce eventually. But if all of a sudden, one or both of them one of them says, I'm going to accept responsibility. It starts to get a little better. If both of them says, it's, we're both going to accept responsibility, do you know what happens? Boom, boom, boom. The relationship starts to function better. It starts to get better. It starts to flow better. Things start to heal. So, how can we apply this today? First, we can apply the way they might have back in their day. They looked at Jesus. They looked at the Father, and they said, this must talk about a relationship with God. Has to, right? Yeah. Is God somebody whose door you knock on, you get candy from, and then you come back and knock again and knock again and knock again? And do you know, I don't remember the kids saying throughout the whole video that you didn't get to watch. Thank you. They didn't say thank you. That boy got Legos, and he got a baseball glove and a ball, and he got candy, and he got toys, and he never said thank you. More than that, he just kept knocking, and he never realized that at some point, God might look at us and say, here's what I want out of the relationship. Like the owner of the vineyard said at some point, I've come to collect some of what you owe me. Not because I want to take from you, but because I want to continue to be in this relationship. And if you give back to me, then I can continue to give to you. See, the struggle is, that's one way to apply it. Church and workplace is the same thing. Do we come to take or do we come to give? What about our spouse or our children or our parents? How do we apply that in these family relationships? I think we've got to evaluate it and say, first question we've got to ask is, am I holding on to resentment? Am I holding on to bitterness? Have I been given something and I'm sitting here saying, no, you can't have any, whatever any is. And I'm sorry, let's just be blunt. In marriage, sometimes it's sex. Let's just be blunt. With kids, sometimes it's candy, food, treats, video games, iPods. You can't watch the same movies. And we just hold it. I won't give until you please me. And we turn relationships into duties. What'd you say? It was probably better than what I thought. Hostage situations, very much like our government right now. 
I won't give to you until you give me everything I want. Nathan, you're talking about the Republicans there, aren't you? I know, the other half of the room is sitting there saying, Nathan, you're talking about the Democrats, aren't you? All I got to say is, I'm not allowed to talk. Uh, oh, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Amen. I was, you got that on video, me not saying it. Right? Thank you. Here's the reality, though. You want your marriage, your relationship with your kids to be just as screwed up as Congress? then stop saying, if you give to me, then I'll give to you. And start instead negotiating on what is best for all of us. So, are we in a relationship where we give? Or, sorry, Seth, you, you just, you're better than my sermon. You're better than my sermon plan. Are we in a hostage situation where we say, I'm not giving until I get? That's the ultimate question. All I know is that God is blessed. He's forgiven sins. He's offered His Son on the cross. He's offered us a chance in spite of all the things we've messed up. And what we've got to decide is, how are we going to live? If we're in relationship, then we start saying the words of Romans 13, 8, over and over and over again. And those words remain, are, are, read are up on the screen. Um, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love that we owe to one another. For whoever loves his fellow man I'll fulfill the law. The law isn't a big deal if we love. If we love. The law isn't such a big deal. Because somebody who loves never drives 120 miles an hour. Because they would never want to endanger somebody else's kids. They would never want to make the police person that angry. They would never want to make the insurance person that upset. God showed His love. And I'm going to be honest with you. So is my wife. So have my children. So have my parents and my in-laws. They don't owe me anything. The reality is we're in a relationship. And the real debt that is owed is just love. That I owe them for all the generous things they've done. Let's pray. Lord, we live in a selfish world. Where all of us, we have some of this Washington, D.C., some of this king and gunman mentality, some of this crazy vineyard renter mentalities where we think people owe us. We lose sight of the debt that we have to our, our spouses and to our kids and to our parents and to our church and to our fellow man. Oh Lord, we've been blessed, richly, thankfully blessed. Help us to respond to that. Lead us back to you. Lead us out of these hostage situations we've turned our marriages and our parenting relationships and our workplace relationships into. Instead, Lord, help us to restore things back to relationships, to loving, tender relationships where we just respond continually with more love and more love and more love. Lord, also, though, help us to know when it's time. When it's time.
to say they killed the Son of God. Help us, Lord, in that moment to trust You, to take revenge for us, to allow You to make the final payment. Thank You for Jesus, for this chance to be together in worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Steps. Let's talk about steps. If you are outside of Christ, your step, this is your step, to respond to God's love. To say, He loves me that much, I'm going to love Him back. And to take that first step, what do you have to do? Turn your life over to Christ. Surrender your heart and say, I'm ready. I'm ready to end this hostage situation by being baptized. Washing the old way of living and raised up to live in a new way. One in which we're in relationship. One in which God puts a part of Him inside of me. It's called His Holy Spirit. And if you want to do that, you can make that decision right now. You need to be thinking about that. That's your next step. Okay? You don't have to make it today, but if you want to make it today, you can come forward. You can say, Nathan, already made that step. Okay, then what's your next step? If you are holding bitterness or resentment against somebody in your family, do you know what your next step is? To end the hostage situation. To sit down with a sheet of paper and say, here are the things they've done, and then just to write, paid in full by Jesus Christ forgiven that's your next step Nathan I don't have anybody in my life like that well then your next step is to find somebody who needs a vineyard who needs this wonderful, beautiful relationship with you. I don't know where that's going to be. I don't know how that's going to be, but that's your next step. All right? Everybody got it? Everybody know their next step? All right, if your next step is to turn your life over to Christ, you can do that. We're going to stand and sing, but wherever you are, let's think about our next step. Let's stand and sing.